吃都不急。Welcome back to Two Nobodies, everyone. Rupesh is here again. Thanks for hanging with this podcast. Appreciate everyone subscribing and and enjoying the show. I have a wonderful guest, someone that I had seen through a video about the fourth industrial revolution, and I didn't knew I had to talk to her, Dr. Nita Farhani. She's here from Duke University, from the Duke Law School. She's a distinguished professor of law and philosophy. Uh, she's the founding director of the Duke Science and Society. She's a principal investigator of the Slap Lab, and she, at one point, I think you were part of the Obama administration, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. So, quite an impressive resume, Thank Nita. You. Really appreciate you having make, having you here on the Two Nobodies podcast. Thanks for making time for me today. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have a chance to chat. Great. Uh, I did, the first time I saw you was, so one of the topics we wanted to uh, focus on in, on the podcast was uh, about the fourth industrial revolution. And I saw this video through the World Economic Forum, and I saw you talk about brain transparency and this thing about how people are, were having more and more insights into the brain and there are ethical issues with this. And so as I was kind of thinking through, okay, what are the topics around this fourth industrial revolution I want to talk about? Um, I saw that name and I had to reach out for you, reach out to you. Really, um, really interesting, going to be really interested in focusing on that topic. You've written a book recently um, that's, that's, that's come out and um, just there's so much, I think, to focus on here. But you're also like this futurist as well, which I'm also interested in. So first of all, just like your story as far as how you even got to this place of studying bioethics. And I don't even know if some people might not even understand exactly what that field is, but also I think you call yourself a futurist. So how did you get to this point? Yeah, these are great questions. A lot of questions there to yeah. begin with. So, so let me start by saying, um, what I do is study the ethical implications of emerging technologies. And where that started was really all the way back to childhood and, and high school, where I was really passionate about science. And my father's a physician. Um, mm. They grew up, my parents grew up in Iran and um, came to the U.S. for my father to do his residency. They intended to go back to Iran, uh, but the revolution happened. Mm. And so I, I, those pillars, which is a passion for science, a father who is a physician and growing up in a family that, um, had, you know, left their country, uh, and now has an oppressive regime, those things together, I think really shaped my worldview. And, not really knowing much else. When I went to college, I thought I was going to be pre-med because I thought that's what you do if mm. you really are interested in science. The class that most interested me in high school was genetics. And mm. so I majored in genetics at college. Um, but what I discovered is every time I would do an internship when I was in college, I would seek out something that had more of a policy bent to it. I was okay. much more interested in the implications and the applications of science than I was in the practice of medicine. Um, and eventually... What I discovered was that that was really leading me in a different direction. It was leading me to get a very strong grasp of the science, but to try to think about what that science meant for humanity. And the areas that I was most interested in were the behavioral sciences, so neuroscience and, and genetics. I, um, I think, developed my first futurism skills when I went to a strategy consulting company after college. One of the few people there with a science degree, they invited me to study the what was then the emerging field of biotechnology. And they sort of just set me loose with some skills and tools of, of modeling that they that they trained me on to go talk to um, you know chief uh, technology officers at, at these small companies worldwide. Mm. And so I went and I had all of these conversations and then I was able to do all of this forecasting and trend analysis and start to get a real grasp of what was happening in biotechnology. Those skills I took with me when I went to graduate school. I went to get both a law degree and a degree in philosophy because I wanted to study the intersection of the science, which I already had an advanced degree in at that point, what the implications were for society. And I went to law school where my first day of, of, of class, I, I went to the professor and I said, 
um, hey, I, I'm here because I really want to study the impact of uh, neuroscience and, and behavioral genetics and criminal law. And he was like, okay, why don't you get through your first semester of school right. and we'll talk yeah. about it. But <laughs> that went on to shape my career. And where I am today is is having just published a book called The Battle for Your Brain, Defending mm. the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology, where I've been long studying the implications of um, be, of, of behavioral sciences for society and in particular neurotechnology. So let me go back to something that you said about just your upbringing. You said your dad was a physician. I think you said that he didn't want to go back to Iran because of, of the, the regime and, and how it becomes so oppressive, the revolution was happening. But, and you said, I think you said that it kind of, sh- some of that shaped how you, your worldviews. Tell me a little bit more about that and, and then how that shaped your career a little bit more. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of conversations in the home that I think many people probably haven't had, and that is uh, to really think about oppression and what that means to grow up in a regime in which rights were taken from an individual. My mother's brothers were immediately arrested after the revolution in Iran. Um, both of them had served in in the previous regime's military, mm. and one of them was regularly threatened with execution on a daily basis and kept in solitary confinement. And these stories of my family, all of my extended family in Iran, plus um, having all of my extended family still living in Iran, mm. and their inability to really talk to us on the phone without being afraid of having their conversations listened to, um, rightly, they, their conversations probably were being <laughs> listened to, mm-hmm. uh, or the the two times that I visited in Iran in life, and just seeing that even in person, people are afraid to have conversations for fear that their cars are being tapped or sure. that they're being watched at all times. That really helps you understand how technology can be misused against people, mm. um, and with an eye toward that, with a with a concern about the worst case scenarios of, of technology, um, I think I approach every new technological development with a healthy dose of skepticism and fear yeah. and to really forecast not just the ways in which the technology can benefit humanity, where I, I believe many different technologies, including ne- neurotechnology, can have the potential to benefit humanity. But, but how implemented by oppressive regimes or against people's consent or in ways that strip people of their autonomy and their dignity, how deeply oppressive and wrong it can be for society. And so what I do is really try to study and predict and understand emerging trends like this emerging trend of the development of, and the use of Uh, consumer neurotechnology Mm -hmm. to understand why it's coming and and how it may benefit humanity, but but most importantly, to raise awareness about the ways in which it can and will be misused unless we make deliberate choices in society to put into place protections for individuals. Yeah. And especially, as you say, when it gets in the hands of these oppressive regimes, if they can get insights into your brain, uh, that's uh, a game changer, I would imagine. Hey, yes, it can be yeah. quite a game changer um, and, and a game changer. If an individual has the ability to access their own brain, to be able to use it for neurofeedback, to use it for their own health and well-being, mm-hmm. that can be really promising. Mm-hmm. But in the wrong hands and used for the wrong purposes, it can truly become the most oppressive technology that we've ever introduced into society. When your when your dad first came to the United States, so it would have been would it have been around the revolution time? You said so. He came earlier than the revolution. He came in 1969, toward the okay. end of it, okay. um, and he had a few years ahead of him to yep. really do his both residency and fellowship. Uh, when he was finished with his residency and fellowship, that put him exactly in line for the time of the revolution. So their intention was to go back to Iran in uh, 1978, 1979. Mm. Um, and they had actually plans to do so. He was he was buying shares in the mm. hospital in Iran, which is what you needed to do to kind of be a partner to be able to oh. practice there. Okay. And um, was packed up and ready to go. He was going in advance of my mom and, and my sisters and I and was going there in order to set up the family and, and get established. And literally the night before he was flying out, he, he got a call from 
a colleague um, at the hospital in Iran saying, you know, the hospital isn't quite done yet. You really shouldn't come. You should delay. And that's the kind of coded language they have to speak in. And, you know, he understood the message and waited. And it was only a few months later that the Shah uh, was ousted and fled Iran. Um, he So he'd been in the United States for some time, but w- did he experience any sort of discrimination, would you say, during that time? Like, I don't know what it was like in for the Iranian United Americans. States. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yes, uh, but it became much worse later. So later when um, the Iran hostage crisis occurred, Mm -hmm. my family had moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and there was a time in the South where uh, I think we were as as diverse as many people had ever you know seen or encountered. Mm-hmm. Um, it was well before Charlotte, I think, had grown up to be a bigger city, and they faced a lot of discrimination. My sister, mm-hmm. uh, my oldest sister in school, was regularly taunted and um, ostracized. My my family faced a lot of very pronounced discrimination, um, and even before then, they faced discrimination as as foreigners with accents. Mm-hmm. But, but not nearly as, as pronounced as it became over time. Mm. Uh, my dad, he came to Canada in the mid-1960s, and he's like, I could count the number of brown people on a hand. Like there, right. were, there, right. really, there was really no one around. Um, yeah. But he always had this uh, approach to, and he, the way he raised us was sort of that when in Rome approach. Like he, um, we always had to adapt and, and think yes. about it. It was, it's not like, now where folks can come to Canada or the United States and you could find your, you, you know, folks in, in, from your culture and live and, you know, don't have to adapt or change. Was that, what was the, did you have any sort of similar upbringing? Or Be- very you, similar. I mean, so yeah. my, my parents um, even raised us in the Presbyterian church because okay. they wanted us to, um, you know, have spirituality as, as mm. part of our life, but they wanted it to be, uh, something that was going to be more familiar in the culture that we were in. And so um, they raised us, you know, going to Presbyterian Church. And we had friends uh, growing up who were Iranian, but most of the friends that they had were Americans. My father um, had uh, started quite a controversy. We first were in a very small southern town called, called Shiraz, South Carolina. Mm. And my father had the first integrated waiting room in his in, in the entire area where what does that mean when you say integrated waiting room so instead of having at the time they had like a um you know black and brown people sat in yeah. this area and yeah. uh, white people sat in this area and there was a literal wall that divided them in the uh, waiting room of physicians offices and my father said I, I have one waiting room and you are all patients and if you wow. don't want to be at my medical practice, then you're welcome to go to a different medical practice. But I don't have a separate area for, you know, people based on their, yeah. their skin color. And he's, he's a cardiologist and he's like, you know, your, your hearts all look the same. <laughs> um, right. And, you know, that was quite a controversy in, in the small town that he was in. He happened to be the only specialist in the town and the only internist. And so they didn't have a choice, but if they right. wanted to be seen, then they needed to sit into an integrated waiting room. But, you know, I think, um, he was startled by the segregation and by the discrimination, but, um, you know, they, they not only raised us to say like, you, you need to assimilate, but also to reject some of the aspects of assimilation, mm. right? If the mm. culture that we were assimilating into was one that was discriminatory, they certainly weren't going to tell us to embrace that. They wanted to yeah. teach us why that was wrong and, um, why it was okay. Even if that led to us being ostracized to making different choices that would yeah. be, um, the, what they, you know, helped us to see was really the, the right choices. So, yeah. Yeah. Are you following at all what's going on in Iran these days? Oh, very closely. All of my extended okay. family still lives in Iran. Okay. So my parents are the only ones who moved here. I have okay. 17 first cousins. All of my aunts and uncles live there. Um, and again, in, in the same way that, uh, you know, they previously are afraid to communicate, they're afraid to communicate, right? They're afraid mm. to tell us what's what's happening there. But I'm closely watching to the extent that I can because, of course, the regime is effectively also suppressing a lot mm. of speech and a lot of media and a lot of coverage of what's happening. I am um, in some ways hopeful because it is a very widespread uh, protest and hopefully revolution. I'm also terrified for most of my family because the brutality that the regime is responding with and the fact that the military is on their side and the people don't have anything like that to be able to Mm -hmm. defend themselves. Um, It's just, it's, 
it's really just incredibly heartbreaking to watch. And at the same time, I think all of us hold a torch of hope that this will be a uh, effective, you know, pathway to change. I hadn't really been following it very closely and it just seems like it came out of nowhere, but I don't know if there was something like sort of brewing that sort of led to this more recent escalation of conflict or. I think it's a combination th of things. You know, yeah. I think that um, the sanctions against Iran really have crippled the economy and people mm. have been living in extreme poverty. Um, the COVID pandemic and the response in Iran to it or lack of response in Iran mm. to it, um, I think really pushed people. And then the most recent elections led to a rolling back of some of the openness that had started to occur for women and women's rights. Mm. And so there was an increased crackdown on the morality police and a kind of ramping up of, um, you know, uh, a, of really harassing women based on their dress and their conduct. Mm. And I think when you put all of those things together, people were just fed up mm. and then it required a spark and the spark was, um, the killing of Massa yeah. and when, you know, they, they killed her for no mm. justifiable reason at all. Not that there mm. could be a justifiable reason, right. But I mean, just, just the, the brutality, the inhumanity of it, it just was the spark. I think that really pushed people over the edge. Yeah. Wow. Um, Nina, do you, is it possible for you to move your mic just to your, over, to your left a little bit, just so I could, uh, yeah, that'd be great if you're okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. I could just yeah. see your face a little bit better. Sure. So. No problem. Yeah. Um, would you, for future, for being a, for, if someone wanted to be a futurist, like you kind of described your path, but like, what are the good qualities of being a futurist? Like, what is that? Yeah. What does that even look like? How do you even develop to become a really good futurist? I, you know, I don't know if I'm a really good futurist. I, I a futurist who I really admire is Amy Webb, okay. um, and she runs the, um, I think it's called the Future of Humanity Institute. And part of what I really admire about her is she'll tell you, I'm not predicting the future. I'm doing math. Mm. And she said, you know, what we're we're looking at is just real drivers and drivers that you can plug into models and and make accurate forecasts about trends and developments over time. And I think. That's part of what is essential for good futurism is to really deeply dive in to see the technology and to see the development of different trends and systematically be able to analyze those trends and then see um, what that you know kind of foretells in some ways. And I think part of it is is to really, look at history and look at how history does repeat itself, but also mm. to be able to pick up on and integrate all of those different trends into a systematic analysis of, of what's coming next. I've been studying neurotechnology and the developments in the field for more than a decade. And during that time, I have talked with neuroscientists. I've read the research publications. I've been mm -hmm. studying the broader trends in society, including artificial intelligence, right? If you, you can't understand neurotechnology if you don't understand AI. Sure. And so being able to see the related fields and, and what's happening in those fields or look at what's happened with CRISPR technology, for example, mm -hmm. and to see what the process of ethical implementation of that technology is, but also see the missteps that people have taken. Mm. Um, each of those, I think, helps us to understand what the trends are that we can look at and understand as they're developing in a field like neurotechnology or any mm. emerging field. So I think it's to realize it's not, it's not a crystal ball. It is, you know, a deep, deep researched dive and a lot of times it is talking to people, right? Mm. It's not enough often to just read the, the published literature. You have to be interviewing uh, and researching and traveling and looking to at see the where construction people are sites. Going, kind of. Yeah, where are people yeah. going? Yeah. What is the technology? What do the people who are on the ground think mm. about where the technology is going? And, and you start to hear, even if they're not talking to each other, you start to hear consistent themes across those mm. places. So. Uh, when it comes to wearable and neural technology, so a long time ago, I got to work with EEG and mm -hmm. I remember like the amount of, you know, you had to reduce that impedance. Like there was a lot of work that you had to do to get a quality EEG signal. Yeah. And now it's like become this wearable technology. Like how, yeah. what's the fidelity of this technology? Like, is it, is it very high? Like, tell me a little bit more about this. 
I think it depends on what you're trying to measure. Okay. So, so let's start there, which is, um, you know, a consumer wearable technology with just a, a few electrodes from, mm. you know, two to four to eight to 16, maybe of, of the most sophisticated of the, of the wearables is not going to be with high fidelity, able to pick up complex, unintentional thought, meaning mm. thought that you're not trying to communicate with another person, um, nor complex thought. It may be able to decode, you know, your emotional levels or your fatigue mm. levels or your attention or your mind wandering. So certainly there are certain aspects of mind, you know, mind reading it can do, but not, not at what we think of as really like decoding my brain, mm. right? Okay. So it's a starting place. The second is, um, a lot of them have become more sophisticated in helping people at home to put on the electrodes in the right places, but mm. exactly where you're putting it may also vary, right? So if I have totally. a headset that, um, you know, is, is a little off, uh, you know, not quite in the right region, it may read that it has good contact, but that doesn't mean that it is picking up in exactly the area that, mm -hmm. uh, it's intended to pick up. Um, Nevertheless, there's some pretty good baseline training that most of them include in the applications as you mm. use the technology. And so you can adjust it and figure it out. But, you know, I'd say where it is, is um, still in early stages, mm. but much, much more advanced than I think most people expect, given the sophistications in the improvement of reducing noise, um, of being able to use dry electrodes, being able to associate more complex patterns with simple electrodes that are worn, for example, in the ear or over the mm. ear. Um, and, and, and again, it, it just depends on what you're trying to pick up. There's still noise, there's still interference, there's still movement that can interfere with it, eye blinking that can interfere with um, the signals that are being picked up. But yeah. most of the um, AI that has been trained on it has become increasingly more sophisticated at filtering out the noise, at filtering mm. out the movement, at being able to tell the difference between real brainwave signals versus, you know, movement or artifact. So right now, the current uh, wearable technology, what, is, what are the typical applications for that right now? Mostly right now, they're still entertainment based, right? So it's okay. something like um, meditation is one of the big areas, using it for oh. neurofeedback. So you can look at, for example, um, you know, trying to increase your alpha waves and decrease your beta waves to try to mm. decrease stress levels and increase, you know, kind of a meditative state, um, using something like a sound of chirping birds. If you get your brain into the right brain state, um, to, uh, to give you feedback on, on what you're doing. Some of it is, you know, moving an object around the screen. A lot of it is things like neuromarketing. So a lot of companies are interested in understanding brain-based emotional and other reactions to advertising clips or things like that. So people who have these devices can go onto one of the platforms, watch different, um, you know, commercials or political right. advertisements or things like that and uh, consent to a company gathering their brain-based response to the different things that they're watching. Um, so those are some of the, the biggest applications or gaming, for example, um, is one of the major applications of, of the technology. Most of the companies who are investing in it are looking at it for things like fatigue monitoring, um, attention monitor monitoring, um, ways that people can improve their own focus and attention mm. at home uh, or at work, you know, without it necessarily being eavesdropped on by an employer, but, but designed for people to use themselves. For some people, it's health monitoring. Um, mm. cognitive, you know, brain training games or things like that over time that, um, can do things to try to improve their, their mental focus or their, um, concentration or their memory or, or things like that. So in its current state, is there something that worries you about this technology currently? Is it more of how this is going to evolve and what this could turn into? My biggest worry about it is it's chilling effect on, on freedom of thought in its current form, right? So, mm. Um, you know, as I understand what can be gathered from the data right now, there is, you know, the ability, for example, to see if somebody's paying attention or their mind is wandering. If used mm. in the workplace as a measure of productivity or to, um, you know, require employees to wear it all the time, um, you know, mo most people are not going to wear it and think, oh, this is just measuring my attention level. They're going to be very worried that it is picking up a whole lot Absolutely. more information. And if you're collecting raw brainwave data, that's not necessarily so far-fetched because um, if it's stored and if the algorithms become better, it's possible that it could go back and be mined for other information in the future. And so it's it's the collection and storage and 
potential for mining and misuse of that data. And you already see some of that um, in countries like China, where employees are having their brains monitored in, in factory settings. And if their emotional levels suggest that they might be disruptive to the workforce, they could be sent home. Or children in classrooms being required to wear the headsets to monitor their attention and their focus. And that having a chilling effect on their self-identity and growth and a fear that their thoughts are being monitored by the state and by the teacher and by the parents. And I think that can have a very devastating effect on human flourishing, on mm. self-identity, on growth. And so even in its current form, unregulated, without rights in place that protect people's what I call cognitive liberty, mm. I think even though you can't pick up that much. You can pick up enough and just having sensors, if they're compelled to be used on the head, right, just ties up, I think, for people so many sensitivities and and, and is so provocative um, that I, I think we ought to be adopting very strong rights for individuals Absolutely. in advance of this technology becoming widespread. So I didn't even know, so it, like in China, they're having school-aged children use this stuff. Yeah, so the Wall Street Journal did a, a pretty big story about this um, where what they found was, I think they were fifth graders, that the children were being required to wear these headsets that um, had lights on the front of them, like red, green, and, and mm -hmm. yellow. They were being sold by a U.S.-based company called BrainCo, uh, and who had shipped, you know, I think tens of thousands of these headsets already to China. And the children were having their attention and their mind wandering tracked, at least purportedly, right? And um, supposedly, if their mind started to wander, you would see a different color light up as well. Uh, and the Wall Street Journal was able to interview some of the children, and some of them said they'd even been punished by their parents if you know, their brain metrics weren't yeah. stellar and um, that, you know, they, they, they found it for some of them to be quite chilling. And, you know, others of them said, oh, you know, it's helped me improve my concentration. Or the teacher said like, oh, my, my children are much more, um, focused in the classroom as a result. But, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing that gives me chills because I think, you know, unregulated used compelled use on children who are trying to figure out who they are and, mm -hmm. you know, their mind wandering is, uh, a core to to their flourishing and their self development. Mm -hmm. um, I just I, I worry deeply about it being rolled out in that way. And at the same time, I would say, you know, if a if a child had a headset at home um, and they had ADHD, for example, and they were able to use it as a medical device without it being monitored and the data being collected by anybody else, but it was used just for them to be mm -hmm. able to improve their own focus and concentration without having to use as many ADHD drugs, for example, that could be positive, positive right? And yeah, so yeah. Um, it's really, it's about how the technology is used and how it's implemented. Um, that's what I'm trying to raise awareness about is to help people think critically about, okay, this technology has arrived. It's already shown up in um, thousands of workplaces and educational settings and museums and, um, you know, counters of like L'Oreal has launched a, um, or is launching a new, uh, system by which customers can can find out how their brain reacts to custom fragrances and scents at, at the perfume counter. <laughs> you know, what's happening to all that data? Yeah, and how yeah. are they going to use that data? And, and are people thinking critically before they put on one of these headsets for a gimmick of like customized, you know, perfume scent to your brain activity? Yeah. Um, I think people blindly give up too much of their privacy. And I want in this instance for people to stop and to say, what are our rights before I put on a headset that tracks my brain activity? I have so many uh, questions to follow up on that. <laughs> but but uh, the, the first one, though, is just like, so, you know, the issues of cognitive liberty, as you describe, um, with these kids and their identity and just overall flourishing, like those issues that you're you're describing. But you, you kind of, you said, well, the counter side to that is that if it could be used in a kind of more isolated setting to support someone's uh, medical development or, or something like that, maybe there's a positive aspect to that. But like in, in the case of productivity, like in that, that example of um, these lights showing where they're maybe not paying attention, is there good research to show that like 
Like, I would imagine the brain just can't always be focused and on. Like, you need yeah. breaks, don't you? Like, Not only do you need breaks, but it turns out that most of our major insights come from mind wandering, not from being yeah. focused. Um, there's a place for focus and attention, right? When, when I am trying to write uh, a chapter of my book or do mm. deep scholarship, um, being undistracted by my email or, you know, my children screaming or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is, it's good to have periods of intense focus and concentration uh, that can get you into what people call a flow state, which can be mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, it's also really useful to take breaks if you if you've ever heard of the Pomodoro method. The idea is that you do like 25 minutes of undistracted work and then five minutes of a break. Mm. Um, and having those very intentional breaks for mind wandering and relaxation can decrease your stress levels, can improve your likelihood of having significant insights that can mm. benefit you and benefit humanity. Um, and also are really important for bringing down your stress levels and bringing down your stress levels are also really critical to being more Absolutely. productive. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think part of any new technology is making sure that the technology is not being used with faulty assumptions about mm. what is good, right? So what is good may not be uh, focusing all the time. <laughs> and certainly in the workplace, that may not actually help the bottom line to have people, you know, uh, like automatons focus, you know, with laser-like focus at all times. And so uh, um, in these examples of productivity, do the, the, do the folks who are monitoring this data, do they understand that? Do they understand these things like as, as far as needing breaks or are they just focused on sort of the bottom line in these metrics? Do you know? Or? I don't know. I mean, I okay. have, I have, uh, I don't know. What I do know is, um, you know, I've talked to one CEO who has started to use the technology with, mm -hmm. with workers and, um, what that CEO told me was that looking at, for example, at a managerial level, so mm -hmm. people say that they work better from home than they work in the office, but their brain metrics show that um, they spend far less time focused and concentrating and far more time with mind wandering or distracted when they're at home than they are mm -hmm. when they're in the workplace. And then using that kind of insight to make you know, um, managerial level decisions about work mm -hmm. from home versus, uh, you know, working in the office can be useful to them. So I, I do think, um, the people who are implementing it, that some of them are, are, are struggling with exactly those questions. Like, what are we measuring and what mm -hmm. does it tell us? Mm -hmm. Um, what I hope is that anybody who uses it will ask that question and say, what are we measuring? And is it actually well correlated with whatever it is that we're trying to achieve? You also said something interesting is that you said you want people to care about this yes. this time, yes. right? Like we yes. give up so much of our data uh, through our phones. Easy example, right? Yes. Um, so, you know, w why do you really want people to care? But also just from your, from how you um, kind of keep your data private, like is there, what, what lifestyle do you have in terms of trying not to share data or what does that look like for you with just the current technology that's on us these days? Yeah. Good question. So first, why I want people to care. I really think that our brains are our last bastion of freedom. Like they're mm -hmm. the one place that you can really entertain any thought. You can figure out who you are. You can um, think a dissident thought. You can imagine overthrowing an oppressive government or regime. You can work out your um, identity, you can work out your preferences, you can work out your biases, you can check your biases, right? You can mm -hmm. say like, oh, I'm, I'm, I notice that I am reacting in the following way. It's the safe space sure. to be human. It is the way in which we define intimacy with other people. We mm -hmm. share what we want to share with other people and we develop intimate and close relationships in part based on what we choose to share with other people. So I want people to care because I, first of all, think this is a profound barrier line that we just haven't crossed yet. And once we cross it, it may be almost impossible to come back from it. And it's very difficult to claw back rights. It's very mm. difficult to claw back data. Um, it's much easier at the outset to set the rules and the norms to say that the device has to have a on off switch, right? If I'm using it for conference calling and listening to music, it needs to have an off switch on device that it is not collecting brainwave data when I'm listening mm. to music, right? That I need to be able to actively consent and choose when it is collecting brainwave data and when sure. it is not with whom I'm sharing that data with whom I am not sharing that data. Um, so I think we need to make those choices now. And I, and I feel like 
you know, people go for convenience, they go for free services, they go for the novelty of something without really thinking hard about the implications. And they don't think about it at a global level. They think about it at an individual level. Okay, if I share my data, so what, right? But if everybody shares their data, so what mm. actually is really profound and it matters? What do I do? So one, I wear an ordinary watch. I don't wear a smartwatch. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I recognize there are benefits to the smartwatch, but I just, I don't want my biometric data collected at all sure. times. Yep. Um, I am, you know, careful and thoughtful about uh, where there are cameras that I am interacting with, what kinds of listening devices I have. We don't have mm -hmm. a, um, you know, Amazon uh, Alexa or any of those kinds mm -hmm. of listening devices in our homes. At the same time, we're not we're not uh, living, you know, in the woods without any technology. We recognize how important technology is, and mm -hmm. we uh, take a lot of steps to try to protect our cybersecurity. And we try to get out there and advocate for rights for ourselves and for other people to be able to use the technology in ways that are ethical and responsible and benefit humanity. So, you know, I'd say I, I begrudgingly mm -hmm. accept a loss of privacy in a number of different settings as a necessity, but not. Um, not happily, not without mm. complaining, and also by making really deliberate choices about what technology I introduce into our lives uh, and that I use personally. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, the the book, The Battle for Your Brain, I mean, again, protecting this sort of last safe space, you kind of got into sort of what drove you to to, to write it. Is this your first book, by the way? It's, it's my first uh, book. Well, yeah, I guess, I mean, so yes, it is my first book for a general audience. Um, I've edited other book volumes. Mm. I haven't done a per, like a individual monograph before. How was the process in terms of writing a book? It was tough. I, I didn't hear <laughs> that. I've heard that from a lot of authors. Yeah. It was very tough. So first of all, you know, I would say, um, you know, I've had a long sustained writing project with my dissertation, right? So mm. my my doctoral dissertation was a deep dive in a in a couple of years that it took to really write it and longer to think about it and research it. Um, I think I had to think less about the writing of that in that the audience for it was my dissertation committee. I wasn't trying yeah. to publish it for people to really understand and connect mm. with and relate to and understand. Um, and so, you know, this book, I really want to raise awareness and to help people understand what's happening today and mm. what's happening in the near future. But there are just countless examples and incredible, you know, deep documentation um, in every chapter of the book to really help people see, like, here's concretely what's happening. Here's concretely where we're going. Here is the way in which we can implement a set of rights to really protect our right to cognitive liberty, as I define it. But the sustained process of it, writing it during the pandemic, writing it with a, we now have a three-year-old, so a okay. very young child at home, yeah. um, having the sustained mental space and ability to do all of that was really challenging. Um, you know, it, it, would I go back and change things about the book? I, I probably would, right, with the, with the benefit of another year. But at the same time, um, I'm really proud of, of what I have um finished with the book. And I really hope that it achieves what I hope it will, which is to raise uh, global consciousness about what's happening in this space and why it's so urgent that we have a dialogue about it in society. And I'm hoping to spark a global conversation about mm. the right to cognitive liberty. How do you want folks to read through this book? Is it sort of cover to cover or is it... Can I'd you... like them to go cover to cover. Yeah, if they yeah. want to pick out chapters, they can. But you know, I, I divided the book into two parts. Part one focuses on uh, tracking the brain. So it's all about decoding mm -hmm. the brain. And, and part two is about hacking the brain. So it's all the ways in which the brain could be changed. Um, and uh, I, I could have imagined doing that a little bit differently, um, but I, I really wanted people to understand it's not just decoding, it's also changing the brain. Um, and I wanted people to understand it from the perspective of, what's happening that individuals are doing with this technology, what are corporations doing with it, not just in the workplace, but also for marketing and trying to addict the brain and change the brain. What are governments doing? What have they historically done? There've been some serious misuse and abuses of government use of technology mm. on the brains of individuals. And so helping to shed light on that and then to use all of that to help steer us in a conversation about protecting our rights, defending mm. our right to think freely in the age of neurotechnology. So 
I've, I've tried to do a lot in the book, but I feel like the best way to really understand the book is to read it cover to cover because it is a set of rights that are within cognitive liberty, the right to self-determination, mm. the right to freedom of thought, and the right to mental privacy. I see them as interrelated, and I lay mm. them out that way. I can't wait to read it. Um, the, this, the second part in terms of hacking your brain, uh, and you said it's about um, how the how there's sort of active changing of the brain. What do you mean by that? Like, I don't know if that's so obvious for folks. Well, so let me start with what you can do, right? I mean, people okay. are familiar with cognitive enhancers or nootropics, mm. right? These are yeah. drugs that college students are taking, that people yeah. are taking supplements, caffeine, right? All mm. of these things can rev up the brain. Um, and so I present both that is a way of changing the brain, but then also the complex question of, is it cheating to take those? Do you have a right to self-determination under any context to rev the brain up? What if you are playing a chess tournament and you are part of the World Chess Federation? What mm. if um, you know you are applying to medical school and you've taken cognitive enhancers all along? Do you have a duty to disclose that? Is it okay mm. if it means that you um, outcompete somebody else who isn't taking those drugs? And then similarly, you can break the brain. That is, you know, people drink a glass of wine or drinks or opioids. They do things that slow their brain activity down. Um, they choose not to wear motorcycle helmets when they could yeah. cause brain injury and brain damage. What rights do you have to refuse, right, both interventions but also to um, do things that intentionally diminish your own brain? Um, so those are ways you can change your brain, but then what about what other people do? So corporations, for example, who might um, target heuristics in the brain, shortcuts your brain make to try to make you believe in misinformation or disinformation or um, companies that try to intentionally addict you to technology with something like a like button or, mm. you know, a scrolling button at the bottom of a show that you're watching that automatically loads the next episode of it. These are all trying to take advantage of shortcuts in the brain and to addict the brain to products. Um, and is that a form of manipulation that's permissible? Is that a form of manipulation that violates our cognitive liberty? These are the questions that I want people to grapple with. And then governments um, have done everything from uh, drugs, like there was a program called MK Ultra that uh, mm -hmm. was um, in the history of the United States where there was intentional dosing of people to see how their brains would react to LSD and mm. if they could do things like extract truth from people or change people. There are claims of um, U.S. diplomats in other countries who suffer from um, something that has come to be called Havana syndrome, uh, with a belief that there could be targeted weapons directed at the brain that governments are using. Mm. Um, and uh, similarly, there's been, you know, kind of a declaration by some militaries around the world that the that the brain mm. is the new battleground, that targeting the brain on battlefields, disabling the brain uniquely is kind of a new form of cognitive warfare. Does that violate freedom of thought? I say yes, right? Yeah. But, but the, the question is, like, we don't have treaties on that. We have chemical weapons bans, but we don't have brain weapon bans, right? And um, I, and so part of it is, is helping people to understand the ways in which brains can be hacked and manipulated and tracked either to enhance oneself or to be diminished or changed or addicted by other people and what sort of rights we need to really understand that. I was going to just focus on on private companies, but I do want to um, know if you had any thoughts to other governments, but with uh, are there any private companies that kind of worry you right now with with how they're how they're either leveraging wearable technology or just what they're trying to do in terms of trying to hack the brain or um, yeah any, anything that anything that folks should be worried about in that case? But then you talked about the that there are militaries talking about the next battleground is the brain, which scares me incredibly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there are there I guess, are there certain governments that folks are not maybe not aware of that are in this space? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, so why don't we start with government, which is to say sure. um, th this is an issue that I think many governments are going to be getting into. Governments have been using neurotechnology to interrogate criminal suspects, for example. Um, governments are looking into developing secure biometrics to authenticate people, and, and a potentially very secure biometric is neural signatures. That is, like if you sing a little ditty in your brain, mm -hmm. um, the way you sing that little ditty in your brain and the way I sing that little ditty in my brain would look different. And is that could, right? Mm -hmm. 
and we okay. could authenticate you, right? So you could okay. sing the little ditty wearing one of these headsets, record what that looks like, and then that could be your secure key to unlock, you know, something. Mm. That's a functional biometric, meaning I have to collect your brainwave activity mm. in order to unlock your device or your computer. And if governments start using that functional biometric, they're going to be collecting brainwave data from mm. you. And, you know, what else will they probe in that brainwave data? What else can they probe in that brainwave data? Um, I don't know. And I think we need to know before we embark on giving governments access to that kind of information. Um, and, co you know, governments from, you know, Dubai to India to... Mm -hmm. um, to uh, China have have been using neurotechnology, whether it's as part of their criminal justice system or, or China has declared uh, that cognitive warfare is you know, kind of the next major focus of uh, the battlefield. And if you could, you know, precisely and, and uniquely target people's brains to disable them or disorient them or confuse them, you could really take people out in, in you know, mutual combat. So that's all really terrifying. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing where, given that the technology is starting to develop to make it possible, we have to really move toward a global conversation to raise awareness about what's happening, but also to help people advocate for the rights that we need to protect themselves against it. Corporations, you know, there's no like particular name I want to throw mm. out there to say, like, this is a bad actor. I would say, corporations to the extent that they aren't thoughtful and are starting to integrate the technology. You know, there, there was a gimmick that Ikea ran a number of years ago where, um, in order to sell some rugs, they like limited edition rugs, they required customers to put on a, um, a EEG headset. Uh, and only if their brain signature showed that they really love the rugs were they permitted to buy it. You know, this was meant to, you know, be a gimmick to, you know, kind of make the products that they were selling even more coveted mm -hmm. and to have this kind of artificial scarcity around a product that they'd created. But that idea, right, that it could be a gimmick to collect mm -hmm. brainwave activity um, without really being deliberate and thoughtful about like, is this a line that we want to cross and that corporations should be crossing and that customers are being adequately advised about before they put on one of these headsets in order to get access to a limited edition rug, you know, it's 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 the thoughtlessness with which people give up their brain data that concerns me or give up any data and the thoughtlessness that a corporation could enter into and, and cross that kind of line that's concerning to me. Yeah, that that example, like if 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 corporations don't frame it to consumers, um, like the consequences of, of or what the data is being used for. And if people just see it as a gimmick, you're more likely to just give up that data. That's right. right. Yeah. You're more yeah. likely to give up that data and, and, and to not give a second thought to it. Like, Oh, sure. yeah. here's what adequate consent would actually look like here. Mm -hmm. Here's what responsible use by Ikea would look like here. Here's Ikea's pledge to you that like, none of this is being stored. All of it's being overwritten, discarded immediately, not, yeah. you know, collected in mind for anything else for other marketing purposes or anything else. Right. That's the kind of thing that like really in advance we need to be thinking about. And, you know, this was just like a marketing company who thought, oh, wouldn't this be a fun and, you know, silly gimmick. That, that's, you know, that that's the way in which technology like this and giving up this last bastion of freedom gets normalized. And I don't want to see us normalize it. I want to see us actually being really thoughtful this time. You said you wrote this book during the pandemic and something that I think we've all kind of seen is folks concerned about their, their rights, right? When it comes to like, you know, vaccinations or whatever it might be. Yeah. And there seems to be a push for, you know, liberties and, and uh, governments encroaching on those rights and such. Do you think that is there, are we in a heightened awareness state of like, of governments being in, uh, of, of governments encroaching on our rights? Like, is, is the public more sensitive to that, that you think that maybe, um, like you're saying, this is this, um, you know, clearly there's a, there's a, a case for what you're saying in your book, but I just wonder about if folks are a little bit more hypersensitive to like, governments infringing on rights and this has become more of a mainstream thing. Is this really an issue, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I do think that, what we saw is is a lot of people being very worried about autonomy of choice and self-determination mm -hmm. over bodies. 
Um, maybe that heightened awareness is something that we can channel in a space like this to say, really part of the conversation here has to be self-determination over our own brains and mental experiences. And um, that kind of recognition during the pandemic is something that will carry through. Uh, I, I think, you know, mass mandates, and I don't, I don't mean mask, I mean mass, mass yeah. mandates are unlikely to be the way that this technology is adopted, right? It was mm. much easier, I think, for people to resist a widespread mandate about, you know, um, which, which many people perceive not to be about their own well-being, but about the mm. well-being or collective well-being of others. Um, I, I, I see this being normalized in what I think of as, as a more careless and insidious way, which is, you know, step by step where, you know, one person does it as a gimmick, another person does it for attention and focus, another person does it to see what art you really love. Um, it becomes something that's normalized because it is a bunch of individual actors who are giving people a seeming choice to integrate the technology. And then it becomes so normal that it's in our headphones and in our earbuds. Yeah. And, and most of the major manufacturers that are selling those have those kinds of sensors as part of what's necessary to be competitive. So I, I, I don't know that what we saw during the pandemic will carry over well to the assimilation of a new technology like this. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, yeah, it was, it was something that was, uh, that I was thinking about because I wasn't sure if, um, but I think that makes sense, uh, uh, what you're saying. Um, I was going to ask you one more thing about, uh, the pandemic before I, uh, shifted a little bit more, but, uh, I forget what that question was. Um, so what would you say then for, for your readers is sort of the key takeaways that you want people to walk away with from this book? Yeah. Number one is um, I've clearly touched a nerve when I present this to audiences. <laughs> people uh, are chilled by it. Yeah. And I have to remember that people are encountering this for the first time, right? I've been living with this technology and studying it for more than a decade. So in some ways it's more normalized to me, but um, I think number one is this is here and it's mm. already happening, right? This isn't just a futuristic look. It is about a technology that has already arrived. Um, and uh, number two, we need to be intimately aware of how the technology is being used and to make very careful choices about when and if it will be integrated into society. Number three is technology itself from my perspective is not evil mm. um, and the benefits of the technology are oftentimes the reason that we adopt it um, and so uh, i think sticking our heads in the sand isn't the right pathway forward developing ethical use of the technology is essential number four is i think that we have a critical moment right now mm. to act um, and that action should be a global concerted action to adopt a right to cognitive liberty. That right to cognitive liberty means the right to self-determination, the right to mental privacy, and the right to freedom of thought. All rights that already exist within the UN Declaration of Human mm -hmm. Rights, um, but that haven't been interpreted to apply to this new and emerging field of neurotechnology. Um, and I would just say kind of as a last key takeaway, our brains are our last bastion of freedom. They are worth mm. defending and protecting, and they are critical to human flourishing. That space, that space for mental reprieve, for what it means to decide what to share and with whom to share it, that's all really essential to human flourishing. It's worth defending and protecting, and it's worth uh, you know, being up in arms about and uh, joining together using that, that fear, that angst, that concern, to work together for a better future. That path forward and you saying developing those rights, I mean, trust in governments these days is so low. It right? is. Like the it trust is. in democratic institutions particularly is, is so low. Like, it is. Uh, how, how do we move forward effectively? Like how do governments actually, um, you know, develop the right regulations or legislation or policy? I mean, also governments are, um, you know, I've, I work in the public sector. I mean, I can say that uh, it's we're very reactive, right? We can be. 
um, and we're not always on top of these things. So I know there's multiple questions there, but I, it, let's start with the first, the trust piece, right? Like there isn't trust in democratic institutions and government. So what will give folks the confidence that governments will get this right and yeah. will actually believe them and, and, and over, you know, corporations that, you know, could be giving fancy gimmicks or, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, so first of all, I'm not advocating for, for leaving it up to just governments and leaving it up to corporations, right? I'm, I'm appealing to a human right mm. and a human right, um, would be recognized by the UN. It'd be recognized by, um, you know, the existing rights that are already part of the, um, UN declaration of human rights and the, um, international covenant on civil and political rights. And, mm. um, and I think it would bind governments, right? So signatories to, uh, the set of human rights that protect us, would be bound by this and would have to, as a result, implement, you know, legislation that would be consistent with it. Can I ask you one question on that? So yeah. I, maybe this is just my lack of knowledge about um, uh, when you're signatory to something like that. If if a government's a signatory, if a if a state is a signatory to that, do they not still have to pass it through? Well, their... so that's the neat thing about what I'm advocating for. I think, which okay. is, um, I'm I'm arguing not for the recognition of a new right, but for an interpretation of existing rights. They've okay. already signed on, right, to the protection of freedom of thought, privacy, and self determination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the Human Rights Committee, which is like the court essentially that oversees um, the ICCPR, that's the implementing treaty for uh, the civil and political rights that this pertains to could simply interpret those existing rights that everybody has already signed mm. on to, to cover this core right to cognitive liberty. Okay. Um, and so it doesn't require people to sign on to a new right. It requires that they continue to be bound by something that they've already agreed to be bound by. Um, mm. You know, do I have a lot of faith in governments coming together and saying like, oh yes, please tie my hands so that I can't use neurotechnology against, um, you know, citizens of other countries not really. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, if we go back to the beginning, I, I was raised in a family that, you know, <laughs> right. yeah. um, yeah. you know, it made me intimately familiar with what an oppressive regime looks like. And so I'm really advocating for an interpretation of existing rights. And you could do that. For example, the, the human rights committee could, uh, write a general comment that recognizes the right to cognitive liberty implicit in existing rights and and therefore updating the interpretation of those existing rights to um, include a right to cognitive liberty and to be part of uh, the kind of core foundation of what cognitive liberty means. So if that gets added, then what, what does that mean? It means that countries that violate it, mm -hmm. right, that there is a cause of action um, there's an international cause of action. It sets both a legal uh, binding on governments to have to implement uh, legislation consistent with that, but it also would um, would basically set the default rule. So, for example, an employer who decides that they want to implement neurotechnology in the workplace, if you have a right to cognitive liberty, they have to seek a bona fide legal exception to using the technology for a particular limited purpose, right? So they could say, I want to do fatigue management, um, and fatigue monitoring. That's the only thing that they could monitor for because they'd only have a legitimate bona fide interest for somebody who is a commercial driver of a, you know, commercial vehicle that puts people's safety at risk. And the only thing they could measure would be that limited piece of mm. information, not the kind of raw brainwave data. So, um, it's, it's really to try to flip the default rules in, in our favor so that instead of fighting an uphill battle, which is what we're normally fighting when it comes to kind of clawing back of privacy or other norms, it starts with an empowering default rule in favor of individuals. Would this actually work in like autocratic states too? If they're signatories to, you know, a, the, the like UN Declaration of Human Rights, yeah. yes. Now, now am I... You know, so ignorant to believe that nobody ever violates human rights? No. I mean, you know, my like <laughs> yeah. in Iran, they're violating human rights every yeah. day right now against demonstrators. So yeah. it's not, you know, like it's not foolproof. Of it's not then. foolproof, yeah. right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it's not there's there's no bad actors are still bad actors. Mm -hmm. Um, but it at least gives us what I think is a, a better shot at yeah. the ethical implementation of the technology. Are there, do you know if there are bad actors who are, are actively trying to prevent 
um, what you're suggesting is maybe a, a, a real good first step, perhaps, as far as getting this changed in our, uh, in our human rights declarations like is there anyone actively trying to yeah yeah there are other i mean so so the oecd has passed um responsible principles of of neurotechnology a lot of different organizations out there have been working toward this ieee is working on um you know appropriate standards on this there's a bunch of academics who've been writing about and thinking about it and talking about it um rafa yusta at uh, columbia has has created something called like the neuro rights initiative or institute mm-hmm. or something like that that's um, that's had some success in advocacy in, in uh, countries like Chile and Spain to try to um, integrate protections. And so this isn't, I'm not the only person sounding the alarm and I'm yeah, definitely yeah. not the only person who's working on this. And, you know, collectively together, I hope that um, with different advocates and with different proposed solutions to the problem, we can not only raise awareness, but also find a pathway forward that ensures people have the kinds of protections they need to benefit not be oppressed by technology and beyond just um you know inserting this in in human rights or um you know governments creating policies or regulations what is i mean you kind of talked about just the average consumer needing to be aware of this and that's an important first step but just as employees you know for example with the use of this technology like what what can people what's something more active that folks can start to do like what to contribute to that positive path forward, I guess. So, I mean, so for example, I think, you know, collective advocacy of, of employees, Mm -hmm. right. To say like, we're not going to accept this as a tool of surveillance in the workplace. Um, that's, you know, you want to give it to us individually, then demand transparency by the employer about exactly what data is being collected and how that data is going to be used and demand that that, you know, data minimization practices be adopted, right? So mm. you want to track fatigue levels? Okay, prove and show and make open to audit um, the evidence that that's the only data that's being collected uh, and that any other data is being overwritten or discarded or, you know, collected onto device and overwritten in time. Um, and so I think part of it is really demanding transparency. If people choose to adopt the technology, they need to read the privacy policies of the companies. Most people ignore them or glance over them or accept the terms of service, choose to buy from manufacturers who are promising to safeguard the data and to make your data your data and not data that's being commodified and shared with other people. Um, and so I think those are just some of the simple, yeah. you know, kind of best practices. And then I think, the more people can become aware of these issues and educate themselves, the better advocates they'll be both for themselves, but also collectively for each other. I wonder, I wonder if labor groups are getting engaged in this in any way. Some of them have. So in, um, in Australia where the technology there's, there's a company there that, um, their technology has been used in, in mining and in, um, other instances, there were, uh, there was a union that actually collectively was able to mm-hmm. keep the technology from being used by the miners, um, through collective action. So I, I, that's the only labor unionization around it that I've seen, um, sort of in a related, uh, aspect of it. There was a, a big lawsuit that, um, was a, a, a class action lawsuit, by um, against the a, a railroad that ran through Chicago. Chicago has a biometric uh, privacy law, okay. and they were able to um, raise a collective action, class action lawsuit for the collection of what was thumbprint data um, that was being collected without the appropriate requirements of um, transparency and data minimization practices that are required according to that law. And so some of that uh, kind of stuff, um, is, you know, we're starting to see some action by, by kind of collective labor organization around the misapplied collection and use of biometric data. So just want to quickly shift focus to your time on this presidential commission, like how you got involved. I imagine that must've been a really neat experience. Yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. I'd say it's, it's been one of the best, um, experiences professionally that I've had. So, uh, I was very fortunate in that I was um, called up by the Office of Presidential Personnel and asked if I was interested in being considered for a presidential appointment by President Obama to the uh, President's Commission on Bioethics. And um, they found me, I think, through uh, some of the work that I'd done on this kind of stuff. And 
Um, some of the people who were there in the leadership and, and helping to bring names mm. forward were people that I had worked with in the past in various capacities. Um, this is what I've discovered after the fact. But uh, So they put my name forward, and after a few months of vetting, I, I was delighted to be appointed um, to what was a 13-person commission uh, that served together for seven years and um, took on a number of very thorny issues. One of the things that was very powerful about that is I think I went from being a traditional academic who would say things like, oh, that's that's a really hard and interesting question, <laughs> to having to really develop a, not only perspective and, and an opinion, but to be comfortable with advocating for that opinion mm. and then also coming up with concrete and pragmatic answers to what to do about ethical challenges that we face. Um, I was the youngest person on the commission by you know, a good decade at least. <laughs> and so I had ex extraordinary colleagues that I learned so much yeah. from as a result. Um, and just the, the experts who came from around the world to testify before the commission and to share their wisdom about the issues that we were grappling with helped me to see a lot of different perspectives and a lot of mm. different challenging issues that go into the resolution of very oftentimes contentious ethical issues. So it was a phenomenal experience. It was an honor uh, to be able to serve in that capacity. And I feel like I learned a lot and became a much better ethicist as a result of it. Very cool. And did that commission just end because of the change in administration? Or? Yeah, yeah. It okay. was a it was a presidential appointment, and so at the end of mm -hmm. um, of of the uh, administration, we all tendered our resignation to mm -hmm. the Trump administration, and it was accepted. And interestingly, there hasn't been a presidential commission on bioethics mm -hmm. since, even though um, our commission followed in a long history all the way back to the Carter administration of, wow. of some form of a bioethics commission or council to the president. So, and I feel like that's more new than ever, right? I think so, but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. you know, it also may be, you know, less confidence in the ability to bridge political divides mm -hmm. to really come to consensus on difficult issues. Yeah. Uh, last two questions, if, okay. if that's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, we typically, I ask this of all the, all our guests, our five for dinner question, dead or alive, who are five people you'd want to have dinner with and be curious, I guess, if you'd have them individually or, or together. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't ever have a great answer to this one. And so I'm going to tell you some of the people who I would love to have at dinner. So one is our late daughter, um, Callista and, oh, uh, thank you. Um, mostly just cause I would love to know, you know, what she would be like and what she would think. And, um, and I think I would have dinner with her individually rather than share her just to have the opportunity yeah. to really get to, um, ask her questions and, to, uh, get to know, you know, her as a hopefully adult. Um, so that'd be the first person. I think uh, the second person um, might be uh, also family, which is, I think I would really love, I, n I never met um, most of my grandparents. So I met um, one grandmother, but I didn't meet my other grandparents. And I would love to meet them, right? Both to yeah. understand uh, my cultural heritage, where mm -hmm. they came from, how they... Uh, thought how they created my parents and and who they are. I think that would be an extraordinary experience to really get to, um, you know, understand and and dive into uh, that cultural heritage. And then I think I would want a a, a great thinker, uh, somebody mm. who just sees the universe in a very different way than than I ever had. And I think that'd be somebody like Stephen Hawking, um, who you know, admittedly would not be able to communicate with the same facility in his advanced um, ALS that he had. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he was able to see things in the universe and ask the big questions of the universe that most yeah. of us never do. And so just the opportunity to really learn from his perseverance, um, but also his perspective on the universe, I think that would be in incredible. Mm. That's is that four? No, that's that, five. That's five. That's five. I have, yeah, I have, that is I have five. Three grandparents who I didn't yes. meet. Oh, okay. Yes, our late yes. daughter and yeah. Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing about your your daughter. Um, that's Thank you. Uh, that's beautiful. Um, last question. Besides the circle of life, what do you know for sure? 
Very little, <laughs> I would say. I feel like every academic tells me that. That's the common answer of things. Well, I mean, I think I think humility is a good thing. So yeah. I think yeah. um, if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that humility is a, a critical aspect of being human. Know that you do not know everything. Know that um, you know every person you encounter hopefully is just trying their best to be mm. a good human, to be a good... Uh, contributor to society. Um, I have humility in knowing that I don't have all the answers. I may not have the right answers to many of the things that I think I have, uh, you know, a kind of clear insight and understanding in, but I'm always open to learning and to learning from other people and to learning from new research and new ideas. And so humility, um, I think is the critical aspect of, of growth and change and, um, knowing that, you can always learn more to become a better contributor to society. Nita, it was fantastic getting to know you, uh, of your lineage, how you kind of got into your career to the genesis for this book. And thanks for hanging with me. I know it's, it was a long, probably 90 minutes, and uh, I appreciate your time and just uh, responding to my invite in general. I'm really looking forward to, to reading it. And uh, where can folks uh, pick up the book? So they can go to any bookstore that they would normally order books from, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, indie bookstores, their favorite mm. library, uh, anywhere that is a seller of books um, will have the battle for your brain defending the right to think freely in the age of neurotechnology. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having okay. me. It was a pleasure. Okay. okay, take care. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.